In this first illustration, we're going to listen out for the sonata form that I've been teaching you about the last two days. So first will be the, the very mighty first subject in the key of C minor. <laughs> Second subject. Beethoven based this overture, Coriolanus, not on Shakespeare's play, but on this young Heinrich von Collins tragedy, Coriolan, who was a semi-legendary Roman soldier. And with its lofty tone of liberty, equality, and fraternity, it was a theme that very much appealed to Beethoven. So this morning we come to Beethoven's second period, his period of externalization. So from the years 1802 to around 1815, we'll see how he wrenched music from the 18th century classical mold of his famous <coughs> teachers, Mozart and Haydn and their contemporaries, whom he had been imitating up until now, into the restless and passionate tides of 19th century romanticism. And we saw how this process had already begun in his first period yesterday. Today you will hear the difference in his 19th century works and begin to comprehend the extent to which he became such a dynamic pioneering force in Western musical history. And after the period of inner turmoil, which we saw so vividly expressed in the Heiligenstadt Testament, Beethoven began to compose bigger works involving extra musical ideas. And the first of these was the third symphony, the Eroica or Heroic Symphony, a significant groundbreaking watershed work that marked a fundamental turning point from this point on, music could never be the same again. The extra musical ideas embodied in this symphony were specifically inspired by Napoleon, whom Beethoven greatly admired and whom he perceived as a liberator of mankind, likening him to the Roman consuls of old. Beethoven now fused this ideal with his own belief in the musician as hero and benefactor of mankind. And the result was a symphony of such magnitude, of such consequence and power that had never before been heard in the concert hall. Just imagine 
how these opening chords must have sounded to the Viennese audience at the premiere in the early 19th century. Familiar to us now, but in 1805, over 200 years ago, Can we please turn off all cell phones or put them on to silent? Thank you. The most radical ideas were present from the outset. The scope of this work was incredible for those days, bewildering in its originality and the sheer length of it. People hadn't sat through such long works ever. It was not well received at the first performance. Critics complained that it was too strange, too long, and difficult to comprehend. Familiar now to us in the 21st century, I mean, most of us who love music have grown up with this piece, take it for granted. But it must have been mind-blowing to early 19th century audiences. I mean, imagine Mrs. Bennett and her two well, her many pretty daughters, for whom she was always trying to find husbands, in their pretty empire frocks, hearing this for the first time. Well, Pride and Prejudice was written in 1813, so a little after this. The second movement is a funeral march, the third, a typical Beethovenian scherzo, and the fourth, novel in structure, not a sonata form, but a theme and a set of variations, including powerful fugal sections. So with this work, Beethoven perfected the new symphonic ideal and continued in this vein for his next six symphonies. Each symphony creates the impression of a psychological journey or growth process. Each is invested with an unmistakable ethical aura. Beethoven's music is edifying. But there is not only an incomparably more arresting musical technique here, there is also a decisive change in emphasis. He personalized the political symphony. The Eroica was conceived as a tribute not to the idea of revolution, but to the revolutionary hero, Napoleon, and really to Beethoven himself, the artistic hero of mankind. The conception of the symphonic ideal and the development of the technical means with which to implement it, this is Beethoven's greatest achievement. But then, in 1804, Napoleon crowned himself in Notre Dame Cathedral with the Pope in attendance. When Beethoven heard this, he flew into a rage. Is he also then nothing more than an ordinary human being? Now he too will trample on all the rights of man and indulge only his own ambition. He will exalt himself above all others and become a tyrant, which is pretty much what happened. Napoleon became no better than the despotic Bourbon kings of old, the most recent of whom, Louis XVI, had been deposed and guillotined along with his wife, Marie Antoinette. Beethoven immediately scratched out the dedication to Napoleon on the front page of his manuscript and renamed the symphony Sinfonia Eroica, Heroic Symphony. Please listen to the rest of this work. It's just magnificent, and there's insufficient time to go into it in more depth here. One of the greatest works of his middle period. <laughs> 
There was hardly a time when Beethoven wasn't in love. And the greatest passion of 1803 was the beautiful Countess Josephine von Dame, ne Brunswick, another of his pupils, and now a vulnerable young widow. She was a cousin of Giulietta Giucardi of Moonlight Sonata fame that I told you about yesterday. Of course, Beethoven had no better success with her than he had had with Giulietta. The von Brunswick family would certainly never allow their daughter to marry a man of the people. The affair with Josephine cooled, but Beethoven wrote some of his most beautiful music while she was his great amour, including the so-called triple concerto for an ensemble of three soloists, a very unusual concerto, piano, violin, and cello, commissioned by Nicholas Kraft, a fine cellist in the employ of Prince Lobkowitz. It's seldom performed because of the logistics of trying to get together three evenly matched star soloists for rehearsals and for concert performances. In 1804, Emanuel Schikanerda, he was the German dramatist who had commissioned Mozart's magic flute um, and played the role of Papageno himself. He commissioned Beethoven to compose an opera for his Theater an der Wien. The result was Fidelio, a heroic story of a wife's courage and constancy and rescue of her husband from death inspired by the French revolutionary rescue operas popular at the time, this was Beethoven's only opera. He would never again find a theme that was lofty enough for his sturdy morals and ideals, eschewing what he viewed as the frivolous flots, plots which had served Mozart and his Italian contemporaries, Rossini and Donizetti. Beethoven took two years over this opera in German, describing it as one of his most difficult creations to bring into the world, his crown of martyrdom. So the heroine, Leonora, a model of valor, fidelity, and love, embodied Beethoven's ideal of the definitive righteous woman, one for whom he constantly searched and never found. Perhaps this and his irascible temper and his unfortunate looks is why he never married. Anyway, the plot is based on a real-life incident that took place in France during the Reign of Terror, after the outbreak of the revolution, but was relocated to Spain for diplomatic reasons. The premiere took place on the 20th of November, 1805, a month after Britain defeated the French and Spanish fleets at the Battle of Trafalgar. 
and during which Vice Admiral Horatio Nelson was fatally wounded. The premiere of Fidelio was a complete failure. French troops had just besieged and occupied Vienna, and French soldiers, in fact, formed the bulk of the audience that night, by which time Napoleon had made himself at home in the Schönbrunn Palace. Between the inherent faults of the libretto by Josef Sonnleitner, the difficulties of Beethoven's music, the dramatic effects of the work, and the general disruption of the French occupation, Fidelio was withdrawn after only three performances. Now, thankfully, it enjoys more exposure. Here is the well-known prisoner's chorus from the opera. Prince Lichnowsky persuaded Beethoven to revise the opera, which ended up having four overtures, the Fidelio overture and then the three Leonora overtures, with which you're probably familiar because they're wonderful curtain raises, four concerts. But in spite of the revisions, the opera had no real success when presented again in the spring of 1806. I saw this opera in Cologne in 2005, and I loved the stirring music and the noble themes, but I didn't like the 1920s prohibition setting with mafia-styled baddies looking sinister in dark suits and fedora hats. Three other great works from this Josephine period are the Waldstein and Appassionata piano sonatas and the Fourth Symphony. Well, Beethoven dedicated the Waldstein Sonata to his friend Count Ferdinand von Waldstein, one of his most loyal benefactors. But as we heard the first movement in the first lecture, and time is so limited, I'm going to play you a bit of the Appassionata today. This groundbreaking piano sonata was dedicated to Josephine and Therese von Brunswick's brother, Count Franz von Brunswick. It's a work of great extremes. You'll immediately be uh, aware of why it was called a passionata. You must listen out for the handfuls of fortissimo chords that soon shatter the brooding mood of the first page. Thank you. 
then we have the bridge passage that leads into a calmer second subject. This music surely reflects the stormy times then taking place in Europe. Napoleon defeated the Russian and Austrian armies at the Battle of Austerlitz on the 2nd of December 1805, known as the Battle of the Three Emperors. It was one of the most decisive engagements of the Napoleonic Wars. The following year, in 1806, Napoleon dissolved the Holy Roman Empire, a sort of Christendom of a sort of e Christian EU that had existed for 106 years since its inception in the year 800 when Pope Leo III had crowned Charlemagne emperor in the old St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Despite these disruptions, Beethoven composed some of his most popular music during this period, including the Fourth Symphony. Now, not much is known about the circumstances surrounding this work, but here he returned to the structure, although certainly not the spirit, of Haydn's classical symphonies. Like many of Haydn's works, the first movement begins with a slow introduction, some of which I've edited, uh, which leads to a bright allegro. This is followed by a lovely slow movement, a minuet, not a scherzo, and a dancing finale, just like Haydn. But the music is suffused with colors, moods, and emotions beyond anything in Haydn's compass. Another work from this year, 1806, whose beauty has an almost unearthly quality, is the fourth piano concerto. And here Beethoven introduced something new. Instead of the traditional orchestral introduction, um, up until this point, the orchestra would play the whole exposition, introducing the first and second subjects. Then the soloist would come in and repeat the whole exposition again. Beethoven allows the piano to speak first at the outset. into the second subject. You'll have to listen at home, I'm afraid. During the winter of 1806, 
Beethoven emerged from his self-imposed solitude and entered once more into Viennese society. He and the von Brunswick sisters, Therese and Josephine, indulged in a whirl of social gaiety. At around this time, he penciled in uh, the side of a page of one of his quartets, let your deafness no longer be a secret, even in art. And he had finally triumphed over his adversity and poured out between the years 1805 and 1812, works of towering splendor. It was also during these years that he and Therese von Brunswick became rather close, the sister Josephine having apparently faded into the background. Imagine two beautiful young countesses, sisters, in love with the great composer, and he, alternately, one after the other, with them. 1806 is the year in which the famous Immortal Beloved letter is thought to have been penned, found after Beethoven's death in a secret drawer in his bedroom. Initially, the recipient was thought to be Gioletta Giocardi, the Moonlight Sonata Girl, the Countess's cousin, but then later research suggested Therese Malfatti, Antoni Brentano, or the singer Amalie Siebold as the honored lady. Uh, from what I've read, most biographers put their money on Therese von Brunswick, but more recent research suggests Antoni Brentano as the recipient of the great man's love and wonderful letter was she perhaps the immortal beloved? Well, you'll have to come to this lecture to find out. <laughs> of course, the difference in social status between Beethoven and these ladies made marriage impossible. Under the code of Austrian nobility, marriage between an aristocrat and a plebeian meant social ostracism. And just because he dedicated his fantastic Appassionata Sonata to Count von Brunswick did not mean that his sister could marry a poor composer, no matter how great his genius. But Beethoven did give to Therese the lovely piano sonata number 24, a far more beautiful portrait than the painting of herself she had given him and which hung on his wall until his death. Although it's clear from the love letter that Beethoven knew his love was returned, the mystery of exactly who she was remains pretty much unsolved. But I've got my ideas. In May 1806, Beethoven composed his three famous Razumovsky string quartets and dedicated them to the Russian ambassador to Vienna, Prince Lobkowitz's brother-in-law, Count Andrei Razumovsky. So each of these quartets has a Russian melody in it in honor of the dedicatee. And this was the first sign of Beethoven's interest in folk song, which was to grow in later years. Russian folk songs are not exactly obvious in the first two quartets, but in the third, Beethoven gave up the idea of incorporating pre-existing folk songs and wrote a haunting andante in what he must have thought to be a Russian sort of melody. So listen out for the strong cello pizzicato, that's plucking the string with a finger, in this andante movement and the melody on top in the other instruments. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
these string quartets are extremely adventurous for their time. Beethoven so strained the medium as it was then understood that they met with resistance from players and audiences alike. Indeed, some sections are so orchestral that it sounds as if more than four instruments are playing. Um, a string quartet is comprised of two violins, a viola and a cello. Beethoven's one and only violin concerto is another great work dating from this fruitful year of 1806. It's unique, both for being the only one Beethoven ever wrote and as a supreme masterpiece for the instrument and is certainly one of what I call the big five of the violin concertos, along with those of Tchaikovsky, Max Bruch, Brahms and Mendelssohn. Well, there's also the Sibelius and others. It was first performed on the 23rd of December, 1806, by the young Viennese virtuoso Franz Clement, whom Beethoven probably had in mind while composing it. The first performance was not a success. Beethoven only finished writing it the night before, and so Clement was virtually sight-reading it at the concert without sufficient rehearsal. This was the great age of the violin virtuosi with players like Niccolo Paganini and Josef Joachim taking the audiences by storm with their flashy concertos and breathtaking technique. In comparison, this exquisite contemplative work just did not impress. But as history has proven, the showy, shallow works of his contemporaries have faded into obscurity, while this great masterpiece has stood the test of time. So there's a long introduction. I'm just going to drop in where the soloist, Yehudi Menuhin, in this recording comes in. So Beethoven produced the bulk of his most popular concert works during this middle period, um, including his often underrated, underperformed masterpiece, the Mass in C Major. He turned to composing sacred music later during his career, but this work was commissioned by Prince Nicholas Esterhazy, Haydn's erstwhile patron, who desired that the older master's tradition of composing a mass a year for the family be continued. Beethoven's mass is scored for four vocal soloists, chorus and orchestra, and was premiered in 1807 by the prince's musicians at his summer chateau in Eisenstadt, which we visited in 2001. It's not far from Vienna. Um, we took the bus there and it has this magnificent concert hall. Well, the premiere of this mass was not well received, partly due to insufficient rehearsal, especially by the prince, who in a letter to a friend later said, Beethoven's mass is unbearably ridiculous and detestable, and I am not convinced that it can ever be performed properly. I am angry and mortified. Thank <laughs> you. 
Pierce. reacting angrily to the prince's question, but my dear Beethoven, what is that you have done again? And furious over the Kapellmeister's audible laughter, as well as the inferior guest quarters that he'd been given at Eisenstadt, Beethoven left in a huff. Don't blame him. In 1808, King Jerome Bonaparte, King of Westphalia, uh, and Napoleon's youngest brother, invited Beethoven to be his Kapellmeister at Kassel, offering him a good salary. Well, the prospective defection of their Beethoven to a French court galvanized three Austrian aristocrats into guaranteeing him a salary of 4,000 gulden a year on condition that he never leave Austria without their permission. So the generosity of the Archduke Rudolf, Prince Lobkowitz, and Prince Kinski thus ensured Beethoven uh, uh, staying in Vienna or near Vienna for the rest of his life. 1808 was another fruitful year for Beethoven during which he completed his fifth and sixth symphonies. It was also the year in which Napoleon occupied Rome and began his peninsula campaign, seizing Madrid and Barcelona. The brutality of the French troops towards the captured Spanish guerrillas inspired this famous painting by Beethoven's brilliant contemporary, Goya. <laughs> familiar music and so well loved by the whole world, so powerful. And isn't it incredible what he does with just four notes, which you can see in his manuscript here. The entire first movement blossoms forth from this single musical unit, one of the most dramatic creations in all music. And I'll be referring to this uh, concept of a musical unit or cell in the last lecture, so remember that point. It's so emotional, this music, so overwhelming, and imagine how it must have been experienced in 1808. When Goethe first heard it, he said, how big it is, how wild, enough to bring the house down about one's ears. Beethoven took three years over this work, most of which was composed at Heiligenstadt. So fate knocks at the door, said Beethoven. He had resolved to master fate. I will take fate by the throat, he stated. I shall not let it overcome me. <laughs> 
And so this symphony has come to represent an almost autobiographical chronicle of Beethoven's great inner strife, his battle against fate, which had dealt him such a terrible blow. The work begins with this ominous knocking at the door, this motive in C minor, and it ends in the triumphant, victorious, glorious, sunny key of C major. I'm keeping that for later. The second movement is a set of variations on a glorious theme, <coughs> followed by a remarkable scherzo. A gentler work is the Sixth Symphony, which Beethoven himself titled Pastoral. He loved to escape from the hurly-burly in Vienna and take long walks in the country. That's where he had a lot of his good ideas that he jotted down in his notebooks. He found consolation in nature from physical and moral distress, from disappointments and bitterness. He once wrote, I love a tree more than a man, Woods and rocks furnish the answers one expects. The symphony was also composed in Heiligenstadt in 1808 and mirrors the outer scene rather than the inner world of the soul, which we saw in the fifth. It's one of the earliest examples of 19th century program music, uh, music I talked about that describes things, that tells a story or describes scenes in nature. It's got five movements, which is unusual, each with a descriptive title. So he called the first one, Awakening of Cheerful Feelings Upon Arrival in the Country. Then this is followed by Seen by the Brook with its murmuring phrases and bird calls, a merry gathering of country folk, the thunderstorm, which we heard in the first lecture, and finally, Shepherd's Song, happy and thankful feelings after the storm. So the pastoral is a hymn to the countryside and the joy it inspires when one walks in the nature. Now, I visited Heiligenstadt some years ago. It's now an outer suburb of Vienna, whereas in Beethoven's day it was a separate town, quite a few hours uh, journey by horse and carriage. Um, it's very built up now, and I followed a tree-lined path down from the house museum and came into a green space with trees and a stream. And the air was warm, it was summertime, filled with the sounds of running water and bird song. It was just magical working, walking in what I imagined to have been Beethoven's footsteps in this part of the countryside and just hearing this lovely music and the, the nature around me. Four years were to pass before Beethoven wrote another symphony because work was disrupted by war. In 1809, Austria declared war on France. Napoleon's armies repelled the defense of the Austrian troops and, in a difficult conquest, tightened their hold around Vienna. On the 13th of May, they bombarded Vienna, and Beethoven was driven into refuge in his brother's cellar with pillows over his ears to try and block out the roar of the cannon, which rang painfully in his ears. We have been suffering misery in most concentrated form, he wrote to a friend. Let me tell you that since the 4th of May, 
I have produced very little coherent work, at most a fragment here and a fragment there. The whole course of events has, in my case, affected both body and soul. I cannot yet give myself up to the enjoyment of country life, which is so indispensable to me. What a disruptive, disorderly life I see and hear around me. Nothing but drums, cannons, and human misery in every form. There was no glamour in Napoleon now. Beethoven was furious and afraid. During the siege, all concerts were suspended. Musicians soon found themselves in financial difficulty, and Beethoven lost his allowance from his aristocratic friends. And then, on the 31st of May, 1809, aged 77, and after a long illness, Haydn died. Beethoven mourned his loss, and poorly dressed and ill, he followed the coffin of the venerable maestro to the cemetery while Napoleon's troops looked on. Yet in spite of these calamitous events, Beethoven produced more wonderful music in 1809, more piano sonatas, including the number 26, Les Adieux, dedicated to the Archduke Rudolf, and the magnificent Fifth Piano Concerto, which is embodied all the splendor, the joy, and the power of the world. As with the Fourth Concerto, Beethoven places the piano boldly at the forefront from the outset. of this concerto is so bold, isn't it? So triumphant. It's easy to see how it acquired the nickname Emperor. Perhaps it originally had some sort of reference to Napoleon, but um, or some critic named it thus later on. We, we're not exactly sure, but I suggest that it's thus named as some sort of Emperor of all piano concertos. The final rondo has one of the most popular melodies ever composed more homework. In 1810, Bettina von Brentano paid her famous visits to Beethoven and found him at the piano composing in a room of extraordinary bareness and disorder. She herself was a poet and knew the great German romantic poet Wolfgang von Goethe, and it was she who provided the link between the two great men a few years later. Even before having met him, Beethoven greatly admired Goethe's poetry and set some of it to music as Lieder, or German art songs. Well, they eventually met in 1812 at Teplitz, a favorite summer spa of the aristocracy, whither Beethoven had gone to try and cure his deafness. And they were disappointed with each other. Beethoven was then 41, Goethe 62, and Beethoven complained that Goethe delights far too much in the court atmosphere, far more than is becoming to a poet. He thought he was too much of a snob and not enough of a bohemian, and rather too obsequious towards loyalty. He preferred the old order which the French Revolution had sought to destroy. Goethe found Beethoven's music unheimlich sinister. It wants to encompass everything and instead always loses itself in the elemental 
he wrote to a friend. And this echoes his reaction to the destruction caused by the French Revolution, the descent into chaos in its attempt to recreate a new world. Just as Goethe was living on the cusp of a change in political history, he was also a statesman. So too was he present for this transition in music. Beethoven represented a great leap forward, one with which Goethe and many of their contemporaries seemed unable to keep up. Goethe, for his part, said of Beethoven, a more self-contained, energetic, sincere artist I never saw. I can understand right well how singular must be his attitude towards the world. Um, and after he came to know Beethoven a bit better, his verdict was, his talent amazed me. Unfortunately, he is an utterly untamed personality, not altogether in the wrong in holding the world to be detestable, but who does not make it any the more enjoyable either for himself or for others by his attitude. He's very excusable, on the other hand, and much to be pitied, as his hearing is leaving him, which perhaps mars the musical part of his nature less than the social. He is of a reserved nature and will become doubly so because of his infirmity. Today, it is the popular Egmont Overture from Beethoven's incidental music to Goethe's poem, which is often performed, usually as a concert opener. And I played that for you in the first lecture. Indeed, it was Beethoven who pioneered the concept of the freestanding concert overture, an orchestral piece, usually in sonata form, not associated with an opera or ballet. So the Coriolanus Overture is one such, which we heard at the beginning today, and others are, if you look at your sheets, um, Consecration of the House, King Stephen, Prometheus, the Ruins of Athens, all too numerous to play in this course. Meanwhile, Beethoven fell in love again with his doctor's 18-year-old niece, Therese Malfatti. It was a foolish affair proved hum humiliating for Beethoven. He proposed marriage to her, but of course she rejected him, in spite of his presenting her with this beautiful bagatelle. The original manuscript of this little piece has disappeared and